Well, good morning to you all. Good morning, online church. I know many of you can't make it here today. Glad you're doing the responsible thing, though. Well, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get started. Well, Father, we are so thankful that we can come together as an assembly and study your word together and hear what you have to say. And Father, as we delve into the deep truths that we're about to explore, I pray that we will be encouraged and convicted that, Holy Spirit, you'll just minister as you will uh, to help us uh, apply uh, the message for us today. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I uh, did not get married until I was 27 years old, which felt like an eternity, right? When you are Single during college, that's cool because everybody else is single. After college, it's kind of like, huh, you get that first e-harmony letter and you think, no way, away from me, Satan. You get it again and you open it up. No, no, not going there. Then the third time you're, you're pricing it out and just, oh man. And I remember I went to seminary and they told us that 98% of the single men who go there graduate married. And I thought, looked around at the competition, I thought, I got this. (laughs) Somehow I defied the odds. Imagine that. And I was actually a a single pastor uh, for a while, which meant I got the, how come you're still single? You know, you ever thought about asking this person out? You know, I want somebody that you need to to meet. And, And it's almost as if singleness was the disease and marriage was the cure. Yeah, single people aren't laughing at that one, right? You feel me? (laughs) But getting people married has been a kind of a popular pastime for generations. uh, One of my favorite musicals is Fiddler on the Roof. And one of the great songs, I mean, it's worth just reading the lyrics as matchmaker. I'll just read you my favorite portion. Hava, I found him. Won't you be a lucky bride? He's handsome. He's tall. That is from side to side. But he's a nice man, a good catch, right? Right. You heard he has a temper. He'll beat you every night, but only when he's sober, so you'll be all right. Did you think you'd get a prince? Well, I do the best I can. With no dowry, no money, no family background, be glad you got a man. Okay, it it was funnier when he watched the musical, but you know, as a... (laughs) But they, they know something. When it comes to marriage, you, you can't be passive. You can't be passive. And, and often that's a default for singles because you don't want to ask a guy out because I guess you shouldn't ask a guy out. And, and, and then you can um, kind of play these mind games where if a guy's going to ask me out, he's going to have to Uh, do all the work. Or if you go out on a date with a man and he doesn't ask you out a second time, you might be devastated. Or you might ask a a girl out and she says, well, Friday and Saturday nights are devoted to homework and room organization. That actually happened to a friend of mine. And he said, yeah, I need to ask her sometime when she's not organizing her room or doing homework. And I said, friend, I hate to tell you this, but... (laughs) She was just being nice. She was just being nice. But, but then there's, um, you know, you might have a, a single man who listened to my message a few weeks ago where I quoted all those statistics, how there's a glut of godly women in comparison to godly men. And they read Isaiah 4.1. And seven women shall take hold of one man in that day, saying... We will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. And you think, I'll just wait for the ladies to come to me. Right? The last man on earth tactic. Or the, if God is going to bring me a husband, he's going to have to do all the work. No Christian mingle for me. Don't try to set me up. If a single guy talks to me, I'll act cold and unfriendly. He'll have to get past my hedge of thorns to rescue me. Subtle, no? (laughs) Well, good luck with that, right? (laughs) Not that I believe in luck, right? We believe in providence, but we'll get to that later. But all that to say, sometimes it's easy to spiritualize passivity with let go and let God. Passivity is piety. And it sounds spiritual, but 
it is unsound. You see, God governs the universe through his providence. Uh, one of the passages that teach that is Ephesians 1, 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. God decrees things to happen and he makes sure that it works out according to it. And, and if you're not careful, you could take that truth and think, well, I'll just be passive, I'll just sit back, I'll just let go and let God. But one of the themes that we see in the book of Ruth is this reality of providence, but also there's an element of strategizing and planning. You look at Naomi in chapter 3. She understands that she is a woman living in a man's world. And she looks at Ruth. Ruth is someone who is widowed, has no man to speak for her, and no real future. And so in chapter 3, we see that she begins to take action. She match makes. Now, this is quite a contrast from Naomi in chapter 2. Remember, Naomi in chapter 2, she is sitting, she's despondent. It's Ruth who's the one who takes action, who goes out to provide. And you see the providence of God in action. Right? She goes out to try to find a field where she can harvest some grain and she just happens to find Boaz's field. And when some of Boaz's hirelings are harassing her, Boaz just happens to show up. And it just so happens that Boaz is a redeemer. Right? It's the providence of God where it's very clear that this is not chance. This is the providence of God in action. And what Naomi does is that as she begins to have this sadness and depression lift, remember at the most basic level, depression is sadness without hope, she sees these little cues from the Lord. She sees signs of God's goodness and she begins to speculate and imagine that maybe providence is leading us a certain direction and so she takes actions to make things happen. She does what I call providential planning, providential planning, and it's living in light of providence, but not passively. It is moving forward, understanding that uh, passivity is not piety, but that providence leads to diligence, right? When you have doors ahead of you, you're right, you ever hear you knock on the door and you turn the knob and you see if it opens, and if not, you go to the other door, right? This implies forward motion. Let go and let God is, a, is terrible advice. It, it, it is contrary to how God wants to live our, our lives, which is always forward walking, moving forward, seeking, knocking, asking, and even taking an honest assessment of the providential circumstances of God I'm thinking maybe there's something here. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about providential planning. Okay, and there's kind of uh, five truths that kind of develop this point. That providential planning has noble intentions. Providential planning is strategic and shrewd. Providential planning regards the persons involved. Providential planning submits to God's revealed will. And providential planning is patient. Now, let me say from the outset the uh, overall application of this is going to center on the application in this passage, which is matchmaking and marriage. And I want to um, just kind of give a message to the singles before I proceed. Number one, um, singleness is not a curse. It is an opportunity to serve the Lord. Jesus was single. Paul was single. Uh, Jeremiah was single. Um, contrary to how you may feel, singles have a wonderful place in the kingdom of God, okay? I remember having a young lady talk to me a few months ago asking, is it okay not to want to get married? Absolutely. Being singleness is a good thing. Secondly, getting married is also a good thing. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. It's not wrong to want good things. That's God's disposition, 
thirdly, I don't want to suggest that if you're uh, single, you're somehow cursed. I remember one of the things people used to tell me is, you know what? I was single until I learned how to be content. Thanks, friend. That's super encouraging, right? When I learned to obey God, he blessed me with a wife. Uh, never say that to a single person, by the way. It's obviously insensitive. Uh, sometimes it's just not the right time. But fourthly, taking effort is a good thing. Don't be impossibly hard to get. Don't be impossibly passive. If you want a good thing, if you want to seek a wife, you obtain favor from the Lord, by all means, providentially plan for it and see what the Lord does. Now, the first step in providential planning is it needs to be framed by noble intentions. And we see that in verse 1. The Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? When Naomi broaches this topic, she makes it clear that her intentions are to seek rest, that it may be well with her. Like a lot of times when people try to steer the situation, uh, they can be accused of being manipulative. And we'll get more to that later on. But, but the problem with manipulation, okay, the problem with manipulation is that a manipulator seeks their own best interest while pretending to seek yours. Okay, I, I saw that in one of those Google quote things, by the way. Manipulators seek their own best interest while pretending to seek yours. That's why we despise them. Now, is that what's going on here? And I don't believe it is. Naomi understands that Ruth is in a vulnerable situation. She is a foreigner in the promised land. She is a single woman in a man's world. Uh, she is unattached in a world that prizes patriarchy. And something that can remedy a lot of that is being attached to a godly Israelite. That would give her a place in society, would even give her the prospects of having a family one day. And so she says, my daughter, should I not seek rest for you? Now, remember after Naomi experienced the grief of losing her husband and 10 years later losing her two sons, she made her way back to Judah and her two daughters-in-law are in tow. And she tells them in verse 9, chapter 1, verse 9, the Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Right? She, she says, I want you to go back to Moab and you'll find rest there. You'll find peace there. You'll find a husband there. And bear in mind, in that world, the only unattached woman that was truly unattached from any male relationship was a prostitute. Finding a man was crucial to finding rest. Things have changed here, thank God. But then she also says that it would go well with you. you know, elsewhere, the idiom, it speaks of bridal happiness, security, a long life, material prosperity, and many children. Uh, in, in all of that, you see that she wants what's best for Ruth. She's not manipulating. And yes, she is planning, she is prodding, and she is pushing. But it is fueled not by personal enrichment, although there is some sense where if, should this happen, she might be blessed with an heir and the family name will not be wiped out. But at face value, she is truly looking out for the interest of Ruth. You see, there's times when... Sometimes um, you have to push people to do the right thing. I was a college pastor before I came here, which meant I had to push people to do a lot of things. Oh, are you not signed up for this awesome Bible teaching conference? Well, let's go ahead and change that. Oh, what? You have to do this, this, and this, and this? Well, I just got around all these excuses, so that means you're going to sign up, right? I guess so. You'll love it. Get in the car. And then thank me for it afterwards, right? Oh, you're not serving in a ministry right now? Well, there's a big need in the children's ministry. Well, I don't know. I might have to get up early on Sunday morning. No, you'll love it. Let me go ahead and sign you up. 
right? There's sometimes when you just have to do that, but why are you doing that? Uh, as long as there's noble intentions as defined by the Lord, not you, but by the Lord, there is some allowance for trying to push people to do the right thing. Like when you confront somebody on sin, what are you trying to do? You're trying to restore them in a spirit of gentleness, right? So if you have this idea that I have to be passive and I can't be pushy at times, well, if you have the noble intentions, sometimes it's is necessary to take the initiative when people won't take it themselves, okay? So the first thing we see is that she has noble intentions. Naomi also has a, uh, she's also strategic and shrewd. That providential planning is strategic and shrewd. Now her goal is to arrange a marriage for Ruth so that she may have rest and it might go well with her. And to do this, there's a number of things that have to take place. Beginning with, you have to find the right person. You have to have, find the right person. She says, is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? Ruth has been working in the fields of Boaz. And Boaz is a potential kinsman redeemer. Remember, a kinsman redeemer is somebody, a, a relative who will basically bail out an impoverished relative. If someone is in debt, they will uh, buy them out of slavery. Uh, they will give their land back to them. And in this case, uh, potentially redeem a, um, a parcel of land and a family name without an heir by providing an heir through a Leverite marriage. See, one of the reasons why Boaz is singled out is he has the greatest likelihood of saying yes because of not only the relationship, but some of the spiritual obligations. Secondly, she stages the right time. See, verse 2, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. In other words, he's going to be alone at night by himself. Instead of going back to the village to sleep, he's going to be sleeping out by his harvest to protect his investment. Further, when he goes to sleep, he'll go to sleep in a merry mood, right? This, this is just being strategic. Sometimes, if you're going to ask your wife to go to a ball game and you have kids throwing a tantrum, she's way behind on dinner prep, and the house is a mess, that is not the right time to ask. If you're going to ask your parents if you can go out with some friends, you do it after your chores are done and after they're having an enjoyable time, right? Is it, at least that's the way it works in our house, right? That's, <laughs> you need to be strategic with the right time and you ask in the right manner. Look at verse 3. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself and put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor. Look the part, Ruth. Now's not the time to put on your, your work clothes. Put on something nice. Wash yourself. Put some oil on. In that day and age, before deodorant, how they remedied body oil or body odor is by application uh, of oil. Look nice. Smell nice. Look the part. Right? Isn't this good advice? You know, um, if somebody does want to get married, it can be helpful to pay a little bit more attention to your appearance. Men, if you have unkempt hair, a shaggy beard, soft body, chronic halitosis, and your wardrobe consists entirely of Star Wars t-shirts... A possum has a better chance than you. <laughs> okay? You know, and that's when, that's when it might be a good idea to talk to George. George, raise your hand. Everyone know George? Okay, yeah. That man right there has given makeovers to multiple men. <laughs> Little Axe body spray or Old Spice. I mean, groom yourself. I mean, look nice because honestly, 
you know, how we dress is a way of honoring the other person, right? If you show up on a date dressed like a slob, you're basically saying you're not worth impressing. And I even say, too, you know, ladies, if you do that, I won't wear makeup or invest in my attire, and I'm going to silently judge all those men who ask out the girls who do, you know, that's, you need to reconsider that. When, how you dress around someone shows how important they are. Why do you dress up for our job interview? Why do you do that? Because you're sending a message of honor. I want to honor you with how I look. And so there is kind of a realistic effort that goes involved, that, that's involved with that. Uh, fourth, you seek the right opportunity. Go into verse 3. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say, I will do. Now what she's doing is, Naomi is setting the stage for a private conversation. Uh, it'd be very difficult for a Moabite woman to ask for a moment alone in Bethlehem in a crowded city where there's a bunch of eyes and ears. And so privacy is of chief concern. She is to go watch where he sleeps, secretly come up to him, and uncover his feet. Now I know what you're thinking. What's the deal with uncovering the feet? Now, there's a couple working theories here. Uh, some people, and I'll just tell you this because it's in the commentaries, some think that it had sexual overtures. That is a way of uncovering and, and tempting into a sexual encounter. But given the character and what we see later on, that is off the table. That didn't happen. Now, what it is likely related to is really a, a dual purpose. Number one, by bunching up the robe, She's going to ask later on in a proposal that, you know, flip your robe over me, cover me with your wings. She's facilitating that action. And secondly, it's a discreet way of waking him up. Did you know you don't lose most of your body heat through your head? You lose it through your feet. If you're ever in the Arctic and you had a choice between insulated boots or an insulated hat, which would you choose? Right? It would be the boots. So this is a way where she sneaks up, she pulls the robe up to uncover his feet, then she lies there at the bottom waiting for him to wake up and give further instructions. So Naomi has hatched this whole plan, and Ruth says, if you say it, I'll do it. And that brings us to the next part. Providential planning regards the persons involved. Verse 6. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. So Ruth executed the plan. She executed the plan. And now we're going to see what happens. I remember years ago, I used to uh, plan mission trips at my old church with a veteran short-term mission planner. And we had this whole procedure that he developed where we had special binders and notebooks, information about the country. Uh, we would meet every week. We'd talk about our schedule. We'd talk about uh, flight plans. We would talk about the culture, teach them basic language. We would train them on how to share the gospel. And we had everything kind of planned to the T. But he always told me this. All this is good. But once we touch down, all bets are off. All bets are off. You never know what's going to happen, right? When you are in a position where you're forced to improvise, the people, not the plan, matter. Case in point, Patrick Mahomes, when he escapes the pocket, right? <laughs> it's the people, not the play at that point, to make it happen. And so here they are. This is the plan she executes the plan, but what we see ultimately is that the character of the people is what makes this work. Look at verse 8. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, who are you? 
right? I mean, this is a midnight surprise, and, and this is where it could have gone all sorts of bad. Now, in that day and age, it would have been very common for a prostitute to do this kind of action. Wake him up, say, we're alone, I need some grain, and make the proposal. That would have been the natural extrapolation. Now, in that circumstance, somebody like Boaz, a powerful man, could have exploited that situation for his own gratification. Or, he could have been seeing it for what it is and just run her out of there. Get away from me, you harlot. But it's the character of Boaz that paves the way for success. And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Right away, she acknowledges who she is and how she relates to him. I am at your disposal. And then she says, spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Spread your wings was a euphemism for marriage. That a husband is to, you know, just the idea when you spread your wings over someone, like a, a mother hen over her chicks, it's, a, uh, it's protection, right? Which is one of the calls of a husband. He is to use his strength to protect. And she is asking him in a symbolic gesture, cover me with your robe, protect me from the cold, for you are my kinsman redeemer. She's essentially asking him to answer his own prayer. Remember when Boaz meets her for the first time, what he says in, in uh, Ruth 2.12? He says, The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given to you, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Right? May God spread his wings over you, Ruth, because you're such a worthy woman. And now she's saying, remember that part about God spreading his wings over me? I would like you to be the one God uses to do that. In mentioning Redeemer, she appeals to his character and his role and the opportunity that he has to redeem Naomi through an act of, of marriage and offering up the, the firstborn son as Naomi's heir. Now, in all of this, I, I think what you, what you see is Ruth is asking Boaz to act like the man he is. I'll say that again. Ruth is act, asking Boaz to act like the man he is. Like a lot of times when we go to God, we, we ask for mercy because he's merciful. We ask for him to provide because he is the provider. He is sovereign and he loves his children. Uh, we ask for forgiveness because he's our father, right? We, many of our petitions are anchored in the character of God. And that's why sometimes when you pray, pondering God's character can be so helpful to empower and inform our prayers. And it's not manipulation. All we're doing is we're asking God to show himself for who he is. And that's what she's pleading with Boaz to be. Be the man who I believe you to be. She appeals to his character. And you see his response in verse 10. He said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, in that you have gone, not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. Boaz is not focused on the sacrifice that she is asking him to make. He's overwhelmed by the sacrifice that she's willing to make. Now, again, I, I mentioned that we don't know what Ruth looked like, but it sure seems from this passage that she could have had her pick. All the young men, rich, poor, didn't matter. Everyone would have been happy to marry her, but, but she looked past that. She is willing to marry an old man by comparison. He was probably middle-aged at, at this point. She was willing to set aside her future, her desires, the life that she would want for herself out of a deep love for Naomi. And he goes on to say, and now my daughter, verse 11, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. 
You're a worthy woman. It would be my honor because you are a worthy woman. Not because she's rich, but because she has high character. So do you see what's going on here? The character of Boaz leads him to accept on the basis of Ruth appealing to his character. And it's easy for him to accept because of the character of Ruth. This was a high-risk situation that could have gone all kinds of bad. Ladies, do not take this as an invitation that if you have a crush on a guy, break into his apartment, sleep on the bottom of his bed while you uncover his feet. Uh, if you do that, I have failed as a pastor. Don't, <laughs> don't do that. But I think what we can take away from this, you know, when we talk about dating, you hear about courting, dating, um, meeting people on the internet, Christian mingle, uh, Sometimes it's not the method that really matters. It's the character of the people involved. If the two people involved in this courtship dating process is high and they love the Lord, they, they fear Him, they want to obey Him, they're involved in their church community, if all those things are in place, there's a lot of flexibility you can have as long as the character is there. But what you also see is it's not just character and the right people involved. You see that providential planning submits to God's revealed will. That as you're trying to figure out God's big picture will, there's his revealed will that you have to abide by. So look at verse 12. Boaz says, And now it is true I am a redeemer, and there is a redeemer nearer than I. Uh, he knew that he was a redeemer, but according to the tradition at that time, it had to be the nearest relative. And Boaz was not the nearest relative. And so even though he might have been elated at this prospect of marrying Ruth, he set that desire aside to make sure that proper protocols ran its course. He would not take a shortcut. Further, he puts his integrity on the line when he says in verse 13, Remain tonight in the morning. If he will redeem you, good, let him do it. And if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. He's willing to make a promise, an oath. And then he says, lie down until the morning. At night, it was a dangerous place. Don't go out at night, Ruth. Stay here. So she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognize another. And she said, and he said, let it not be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. Now, there's a lot here where you see compliance to the will of God. Number one, we're not married yet. And we're not going to act married. And we're not going to give the impression that we acted married. He wants to protect their reputation, protect her reputation. Secondly, what would have happened if they would have been caught together and there would have been speculation that they had a midnight tryst? Boaz would then go to this potential redeemer and say, would you like to redeem Naomi's land? And you're going to have to marry Ruth as well, and this other redeemer were to think that he just had a tryst with her, you can see how that would tip the scales in favor of Boaz getting what he wanted, right? He wanted this process to be done with absolute integrity. He wanted to protect her reputation. He wanted to honor the Lord with their sexual behavior. And he wanted to make sure that he didn't use a tryst or anything to manipulate the situation in his favor. Now, there's obvious implications for this, right? If you are in a, a dating relationship, maintaining sexual integrity and purity is essential. I have seen uh, multiple relationships start to use sex as a way to rescue the relationship. 
If we sleep together, he'll have to marry me. We seem to fight all the time. The relationship is kind of falling apart. Well, if we sleep together, we'll feel close again. And one way that if you want to have a relationship that honors God, and I understand, you know, some of you, you have done that, and you would say amen with me, okay? But if you want to have a relationship which honors God, it is imperative that you practice sexual purity. I remember when I was dating my wife, she told me that if I so much as touch her inappropriately, the relationship's over. I was like, wow. It actually made her more attractive to me, but you know, it was. But she took it seriously and she meant it, right? Because she did not want that clouding our judgment. If you're trying to figure out the, the will of God, right, is this the right person for me? then you need to make sure you're walking in the will of God as you're making that determination. And sexual sin just clouds your judgment. Flee sexual immorality. And men, young men, respect from your wife is relational gold, isn't it? You talk to any man, any man around here, and they'll tell you, when my wife respects me, it's gold. I love it. One of the easiest ways to acquire that gold from the onset is to keep your hands off of her while you're dating. That demonstrates that you want to protect her purity. It demonstrates self-control. It demonstrates that you're able to rein in your desires. It demonstrates that you have a fear of the Lord. Agreed? And that just doesn't happen by accident. You take steps to make sure that you guard her purity. And it goes both ways. If you want to know the will of God, make a commitment to that. And fifth, providential planning is patient. Verse 15. And he said, bring the garment you are wearing and hold it out. And so she held it and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. And she went into the city. He actually gave her three times the amount that he gave her in uh, chapter 2. Some people estimate that it was like 96 pounds of grain. Ruth was a strong woman, apparently, right? <laughs> and when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did it fare, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, these six measures of barley he gave to me. For he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Right? The Lord was kind, and this is where we see the wisdom of Naomi. She replied, Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. So wait. Sometimes you do all that you can do, and then you wait. You be patient. Naomi understood the wisdom of Proverbs 16, 9. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. You want that job. You train for it. You get the certification. You practice for the job interview. Then you sit down for the big day and you give it your best shot. Then you wait. You want to start a family. You see the doctor. You do all the things. And then you wait. You go out on that first date. Seems to go great. You loved it. You definitely go out again. But then you have to, have to wait. You know, sometimes you can plan everything and you can do everything right. And you wait and you wait. And sometimes it breaks that way. The Lord used those efforts, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't. And, and what do you do with that? Well, that's when you understand that ultimately providence is king. And the one who wields his hands of providence will use it for your benefit eventually. Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. That relationship that didn't work out. If you love the Lord, 
He just had other plans. And no, he didn't rescue you from a terrible, abusive relationship. Sometimes godly people just, it's just not in the cards. Maybe that's the wrong way of saying that. That's kind of a voodoo. Uh, It's just not in his plan. Not in his plan. And, And I always tell people that when that happens, God has something better for you. I don't say someone better for you, but something. And you have to remember that the whole purpose of like pursuing these relationships, it's the ultimate purpose is to procure a sense of worship. Ephesians 5, 25 through 33, here's the whole point of it. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. All right, the whole point of marital bliss is to point to eternal bliss. Right? In heaven, nobody will be married. Well, actually, all of us will be married as a church to the bridegroom. And when you see Jesus face to face, some of those heartbreaks, you know, those relationships that did not work out, you'll have a different perspective on it then. You'll know that that didn't work out, and for some reason it was for your good. We know this because according to um, Romans 8, 32, he did not spare his own son, but gave himself up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Yeah, if God does not give you what you planned, that's fine. But it was not wrong to plan either. Right? It's not wrong to believe he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. It's not wrong to work to that end. And sometimes it does lead to disappointment. Sometimes it does lead to heartbreak. But you know what? Often the Lord uses that to do a greater work in in your life as well. All this to say, passivity is not piety. Knowing that God is in control of the universe and that he has a plan for your life means that you go forward in, in kind of a, with a hopeful disposition that the Lord will guide you as you seek to walk with him. Right? I've always heard, walk with the Lord and do what you want. If you want to know the will of God, you obey him and you go forward. And, and when some doors are in front of you, then yes, by all means, don't just sit there and just wait for the door to, to open. You walk forward, you turn the knob, and you pull to see if this is where you should go. Passivity is not piety. The providence of God should give us greater confidence that as we move forward, walking with the Lord, seeking to honor Him, when that's our disposition, we're walking in the Spirit, moving forward, the Lord will direct our steps and guide us into the wonderful providence that He has for the people of God. Let's pray. Well, Father, we are just grateful that You work in real time that you're guiding us, molding us, and shaping us. And Lord, there are many times when we want to take matters into our own hands and we, we turn away from that. We do need to wait on you. But there's other times when you are asking us to take steps of faith and move forward. Where that balance is, you know, and I just pray, Holy Spirit, you'll help us to sift the difference. And I do pray for the singles here. Lord, if it is your will for them to be married, that they will be patient Uh, They will do what they can, seeing it as a good thing. And I pray that as as a church, we will will value them and nurture them and, and, and seek to fully integrate them into our family, married or not. And Lord, we we pray for other people who are facing life decisions, that they will uh, take their plans to you, pray about it, have the noble intentions, but ultimately step forward in faith and just see where you lead. We pray for all of this in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to sing one more song, and then if some of you have some questions or you want to talk to um, uh, 
uh, a counselor afterwards. If you go to that back corner, they'll be available for you. I invite you to stand with us once again if you're able. As we sing together, I'll fly away.